Learning how to tell if your soil is healthy or not, coming up on the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener. Welcome to Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener. I'm Holly Baird. This show is got dedicated to the average gardener, simple home living, and using what you already have. We're going to take a look back to this past summer where Joey tested the soil in the garden. We're going to see how healthy it is and it was ready for spring planting. Let's see what he found out. Today we're going to talk about how to tell if your soil is healthy or not. And there's many different ways to accomplish this. But the key to healthy soil is a good harvest. There's nothing worse than to work all year and weed and plant and plant and then come out with very poor, unhealthy, sad looking a harvest. So the many different ways is to test your soil. The key to testing your soil is to see how acidic or how alkaline your soil is. The scale ranges from 1 to from 0 to 14, 7, 7 being neutral. The majority of vegetable plants that you will probably plant in your garden want a 7 level neutral in their soil. Except for, for example, blueberries. They want a 4.5 because they, they want a very acidic soil. To... The unit we're using today tests three things, moisture, light, and pH levels. Today we're going to focus on the pH levels. This device is about $7 and $12 at our local home and garden center. Soil testers can range from a few dollars to several hundred dollars depending on the in-depth information you want to obtain from your garden. There are digital readouts, test tubes with tablets that you mix with water. Ours is a dial readout and other people choose to send soil samples to the local university for a small fee and that is recommended if you do choose that way to do it every three years. Right here as we probe down you want to probe it below the top of the soil about where the root level would be. As you can see, the alkaline level is right at a 7, and that's where we want it to be. That is that bottom line. Now, if it was over to 3.5, that's not good, and if it's too high, that's not good as well. And there's different ways of fixing the problem if you come out of that neutral level, that 6.2 to 7.0 area. So let's go to other parts of the garden and see how they, rain, they compare it to where we're at right here. At the garden we have 1,800 square feet, plus next year we're going to have an additional two gardens with 200 square feet. So we felt that this was an ideal investment for what we were going to do. So we're back on the back side of the garden. This is the first year for this particular area of the garden. And it did quite well, so we're just going to test and see the acidity level here. Now our soil tested a 7. Now if your soil tests too high or too alkaline, you want to add sulfur to bring that number down too low or too acidic, you want to add lime to bring that number up. And there's charts and graphs online to tell you the correct amount to apply per square foot. Now, if you're going to probe this and the soil is too hard, don't try to jam it in the ground because you will snap these probes off. All you need to do is make a slight little well to where you're going to put it, take some water, and just soften the soil. Let it sit for a minute, let the soil soak it in to, so you can get an accurate reading. So we're just gonna put it here. If you use water to soften the soil, you wanna use distilled water, not well water or city water. The chemicals in the water will alter your reading. So over here next to the tomatoes, right here is where we had the potatoes this year. And I wanted to check to see how good the soil was because we had really good uh, Yukon potatoes and red potatoes this year. So we did look at it and it is setting it right at neutral seven. So the soil is real good. So there's certain areas of this garden that's gonna need a little help come next spring. And some of the areas that won't need any help at all. So take a little time, take a, a few dollars and invest in a good soil tester and you'll reward yourself later with a bountiful harvest. In the winter, a mushroom growing kit is a fun activity for whatever age you may be. This one is a white button mushroom kit. We purchased this at a local home and garden center for about $17. We had a 20% off coupon from their local email, which was nice. Now, mushroom kits are available in stores and in catalogs from about the end of October to the beginning of April. This here is a white mushroom, white button mushroom kit. And it's very simple to, to do, to grow and to maintain. They send in-depth instructions, uh, very detailed on what you need to do, what you should do, and what you can't do. So what we have here is the basis of our mushrooms. Uh, the white uh, stuff in there is the spores, or in layman terms, the seeds. And then 
Also, come, what comes with the package is the casing soil, which is basically the top soil we put on top of the mushrooms to allow them to grow. So that's what we're going to do. Want to have a sharp knife. Now, before handling any of this, these mushroom spores are a live organism, so you want to be sure your hands are clean, and any tools that you're using are clean as well. So what we're going to do is just going to take these, the soil, and just put it on top of the mushrooms spores there get my shovel and then you just want to level it off get it all covered because that's what's going to enable the mushrooms spores to grow now we had a kit last year did relatively well this kit and uh, this kit should produce on roughly about 10 pounds of white button mushrooms and if you let it go, you, uh, the button mushrooms go, they will open up to the portobello stage so you can get a little more um, growth out of them. So what you do here, now that we've got this leveled, you don't want to compact it, you just want to level it off to where it's almost even across the whole top of the spores on the compost bag here. Then what we'll do is you close the bag up but you want to leave a little space for the uh, air to, uh, moisture to evaporate. Set it in a warm area. The instructions uh, tell us great in great detail. Set it in a warm area from 70 to 76 degrees. So we'll put it close to the radiator. And then once the spores begin to grow in a few days, then we'll move it to an area between 62 and 65 degrees. After you get your mushrooms established from that 70 to 76 degree area, you want to move it to a cooler area, 62 to 65. And what we're going to put is behind the desk, my, my, my desk in the office, because I can monitor it, I can check on it daily, and it's very visual, out of sight, out of mind. It's very true when it comes to something like a mushroom kit. Now, if you're in the basement a lot, and your basement is at 62 to 65 range, that's an ideal spot. Now, you want to water your mushroom kit. Not pour water on it, you want to mist water on it. Uh, you can pick these up at the dollar store, these misters, just for a few dollars, uh, for a dollar or 50 cents, something like that. And you want to keep the topsoil moist, to keep the uh, fungi, the mushrooms continue growing. And there's more information on that and the instructions that you get with it. But just some more handy tips that will help your mushrooms grow better and you won't forget about them. But there's nothing better tasting than a mushroom you grew yourself. And we'll keep you updated throughout the season of our growing mushrooms on upcoming shows. Collecting and displaying your blue jars is one thing you can do with them. Or you can turn them to everyday household items. What we have here is a soap dispenser made out of a blue jar and a sugar dispenser. Now, you don't have to use blue jars for this, but it does add a little character and it looks kind of neat when you do it. So we're, I'm going to show you how to do both of them. First, the soap dispenser. You want a soap bottle, uh, empty. And you want, you're going to need uh, the top part, the threads, and the pump. So what you want to do is you want to cut the top part off, and you want to cut the from the base. So you have your threads, and you have a little bit of the base there. And I'll show you why in a minute here. You can get rid of the bottom part. Then you want to take an old lid or a new lid, whichever you have available. Take and place it in the center. Take a permanent marker. Make a circle around it. And then you want to cut that top, that circle out, whether it be with tin snaps or some kind of metal cutting scissors or take a drill bit and drill it out. Then you take your threads and the base and you simply thread it through there. And the reason why you want to have your uh, base there is because you're going to need some of that base when you take your pump and thread it and put it through the threads. You need that structure there so the threads doesn't pull through the lid. So once you've got that nice and snug, take your blue jar, simply place that in there. Then you want to get your canning ring and tighten it down. Now over time, this we found, as you see here, moisture will get in there and start uh, rusting that metal lid all out. So you want to have some kind of waterproofing, uh, either clear nail polish or some kind of metal water resisting uh, stuff you want to put on top to keep that from rusting. And you can put your favorite hand lotion or hand sanitizer in there. And it's a very nice display item behind your kitchen sink or your bathroom sink, wherever you want to place it at. Sugar dispenser, same, same concept. You take your uh, canning ring. And where you get this from is you get this metal lip from 
yep, an old salt uh, cardboard salt uh, cylinder. So you take your uh, ring and you want to mark again around uh, the, the top of it and you'll cut it out the width of the ring, not the width, not the inside, but the outside. So when you take your cardboard top, you can slide it straight in there, and this can be used for wide mouth or small mouth jars, or regular mouth jars, and you can paint the top whatever color you want, and simply put it on top of the jar, and it's a great, nice, decorative piece for your table, whether for your own self or when you have guests come over. So two items, two different ways you can display your collector canning jars. Swiss chard is a leafy green vegetable that's easy to grow. It's uh, in the beet and spinach family, but unlike beets, Swiss chard cannot be, the roots cannot be eaten. It, it's very easy to grow, as you can see. We have some in a portable homemade box. We all, you can also grow it in the garden, and it's grown almost year-round in most areas. Unlike spinach, Swiss chard can, can tolerate the heat and drought a little bit more better than spinach. And as you can see, it's a very easy plant to harvest. Uh, like spinach, you just take and, and cut it down. Now, obviously, we're harvesting these a, a, a little on the young side, strictly because we can eat the stems. As you can uh, tell, Swiss chard you'll see in the store is a very tall and leafy vegetable with thick stems. Uh, Swiss chard is uh, growing more and more and more in popularity throughout the United States and in Europe. It, as the, again, it can be eaten raw or it can be cooked down. Now, if you're going to cook it down and it's in the full mature stage, you want to separate the leaf from the stem. And there's many recipes online to help you with that. Again, Swiss chard is something that uh, I would encourage you to try for next year's garden. Whether you collect blue canning jars or they've been passed down in your, in your family for generations, the question is why are they blue? Well, that famous blue color was discontinued in 1937. Glass makers had produced and controlled this color since the late 1890s. It was caused by the minerals in the sand they used in their glass batches. That sand came from the shores of Lake Michigan. And it also dictated the amount of oxygen they used in the furnaces to melt their glass. On the bottom of the jars, there are numbers. Each jar maker was assigned a number, and at the end of the day, their employer would pay them for the number of jars they made with their assigned number to them. The rumor that the number 13 jar are rare on the market due to the superstitions of moonshiners who broke them while running the illegal liquor is simply not true. There are many 13 jars on the market. Though they are rare, they are not scarce by any means. Thanks for watching our show. I hope you enjoy watching it just as much as we enjoy bringing it to you. As you can see, testing your soil is something that we definitely recommend and something that's going to make a big difference at the end of the fall between a small harvest and a happy, healthy, bountiful harvest. And that mushroom kit, that definitely is a neat activity that you can share with friends and family or just try out for yourself and compare year after year. From all of us at the garden, I'm Holly Baird encouraging you to bring a child with you gardening and let those memories grow and this week be thankful for everything that you have even the small stuff we're wishing you and yours a happy thanksgiving the show doesn't have to end here you can continue the discussion on our facebook page keyword wisconsin vegetable gardeners and like the page you can also email your questions comments or suggestions at the wi at gmail.com and we may use your question on an upcoming show.